Good morning, uh, friends in US. Uh, our speaker, Emily Jue. And uh, good afternoon to uh, friends in Europe. Good, good evening to uh, the people in Asian countries. Yeah. So I'm very happy uh, to welcome Dr. Emily Jue uh, for this uh, lecture uh, in the W2S uh, seminar series. We are very happy to hear her. I have heard her before and she gives very nice talks. So uh, probably many of you may know her. Um, so Emily is currently uh, working as an associate of the National Institute of Standard and Technology, popularly known, known as NIST, and also working as a research associate at the University of Colorado Boulder. She obtained her PhD from the University of Grenoble uh, from SpinTech or with SpinTech in 2013, after which she did a postdoc at NIST Boulder. Her current research focuses on spintronic devices for neuromorphic applications at the hardware level. And she is a senior member of the IEEE Society. So with this very brief introduction, I welcome you all. And many thanks, uh, Emily, for accepting our kind invitation and giving this lecture on behalf of my co-convener, Rajbhushan Singh, other WQS team members like uh, um, Puspendra, Sakti, Azhar, and others. I again extend my heartfelt thanks for you. I really appreciate. And uh, I appreciate also the kind uh, patience from the participants. Uh, sorry for any inconvenience. Uh, it was some internet issues. Now we are ready. And uh, I just like to mention that during the lecture, we don't take any questions. So if you have any questions, kindly write that in the chat box or raise your hand. At the end of the lecture, we will take all questions. And just at the end of the lecture, I would request you all to switch on your video so that we can take a group photo and then we will take the question answer. So with this, so thank you so much and looking forward to a lecture, Emily. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I really want to apologize for this technical issue, this problem. I never had that happening before. Uh, I really appreciate everybody's patience here and uh, um, I hope you're going to enjoy the talk. So thank you again for inviting me to come here and to give this seminar. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, today I'm going to talk about our work on magnetic Josephson junction for artificial synapses. So before I start, uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, just tell a little bit more about my work environment. So I work at NIST in Boulder, which is in Colorado. And um, it's, uh, we have the chance to work in this beautiful environment, which is very close to the mountains. Uh, and we're still very close to town. So here is the building where we work and here is where we play. So at NIST, I work um, in the Spintronics group, which is led by Bill Rupard and Matt Puffall. And uh, NIST stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology. So meaning that we, uh, as a people working at NIST, we have two main missions, which is performing research for metrology, but also for advanced devices for emerging device technologies. And all of that is to support uh, the American industry. So the, the device I'm going to present today are more part of this second category. So in this context, uh, here is the type of work that we do at NIST uh, in the Spintronics group. So I'm not going to go into the details of all these figures. Just wanted to show you a brief overview of what we do, like we have a, a pretty wide variety of work. Uh, and uh, we're always looking for postdocs. So if anyone is interested uh, to, to know more about what we are doing, please feel free to contact me. Today, I'm going to focus uh, on this device, which is a device that we developed at NIST, and which is a hybrid superconducting magnetic device that we can use as artificial synapse. So I would like to start by acknowledging all the people who contributed to this work. So it includes several institutions. And uh, I would like to point out that um, 
uh, a lot of the results I'm going to present here has been uh, obtained by Mike Schneider. And the idea of the device that I'm going to present has been proposed by Steven Rosek. So here is the outline of my talk. I'm going to start with an introduction where I'm going to give you some background on neural networks. And I'm going to uh, show you why we are uh, interested in developing hardware for AI. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to introduce our device, which is a magnetic Josephson junction. I will show you that we can use it as an artificial synapse. Finally, I'm going to uh, show you how we can include this device in some applications within a neural network. So let's start with the introduction. So here, when I'm talking about AI, I'm thinking about bio-inspired neural network. The principle of a bio-inspired neural network consists in creating a network a network of neurons that is connected by synapses. The role of the synapse is to adjust the strength of the connection between two neurons. The synapse is responsible of the plasticity, which is the capability that we have to learn and to modify the memory. In a simplified picture, in a neural network, uh, we have an electrical spike that is emitted by a presynaptic neuron. And this spike is then transmitted to a synapse, which is going to modify the amplitude of the signal by applying a synaptic weight on it. This signal is then tr uh, transmitted to a postsynaptic neuron, whose function is to add up all the incoming signal and to fire an output spike only if the resulting amplitude is high enough. So all these actions that I describe here, they can be simulated at the software level through different algorithms. In fact, all the application of AI that you use every day are made at the software level. So software neural network is everywhere nowadays. A few classic examples that I could give would be Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, or Facebook. All these names are names that we're all very familiar with, that we would use on a daily basis, and they all rely on uh, neural network software to operate. Uh, we can also use uh, AI for self-driving car, medical diagnosis, but uh, also for less obvious applications, such as drug design, or farming, or one that was surprising for me, like beer brewing, and so on and so on. So here we see that the progress in terms of software algorithms in the last decade has allowed many exciting applications. However, uh, the increase in performance all also comes with a significant demand in terms of training. On this graph here, I'm showing the amount of compute that we need uh, to, to train a single model as a function of the years in the last decades. We can see here that the training demand has been doubling every three months over the last decade. So in comparison, it is about seven times the exponential rate that we, will, that we observed before with the Moore's law. So the reason of this significant change here between the first era and the modern era is that in 2012, uh, people started combining deep learning algorithms with more powerful hardware. These hardware are digital circuits, such as GPU or TPU. And don't worry if you don't know what, what that means, but those are hardware that are often called hardware for AI but their function is still to perform digital logic and run software algorithms. So as you can imagine, um, the high training demand of this software algorithm has a cost in terms of time, but also in terms of energy. 
So which also means that they also have a financial cost. For I like to point out uh, this example here uh, where it was estimated that the, um, the cost in computing power to replicate the experiments that are reported in the paper of AlphaGo Zero is about $35 million over 40 days of training. So here, just give us a, a good idea of what type of cost, financial cost we're talking about too. So um, one solution that is proposed to reduce this cost is to develop hardware for AI at the device level because it has the potential for a fast and low energy computing. So to make hardware for AI at the device level, we need to be able to recreate each building block of a bio-inspired circuit. So as we have seen earlier, it, it includes the neurons uh, as a signal source, so the presynaptic neuron, but also a signal analysis, which is a postsynaptic neuron. It also includes uh, being able to do a synapse at the device level, which will allow to apply some weight on the signal. And because we're talking about hardware, we also need to take into account the connectic, meaning that here we need also to be able to, um, to recreate the building block of the axon, which is a connection that allows to propagate the signal. It turns out that all these building blocks can be made at the device level with Josephson junctions. So don't worry if you don't know what is a Josephson junction. I will make sure that uh, I, remain the, I will remind the basic concepts that you need to know here to understand. So why do we want to work with Josephson junctions? Uh, especially like here we all do spintronics. So what, what pushed me to, to study that? Well, it turns out that the Josephson junction is naturally a very good candidate for neuromorphic computing. For example, in the same way that the brain can transfer information with quantized pulses, the Josephson junction can naturally emit these quantized spikes uh, that we actually call single flow quantum. Here I'd like, I'd like to point, point out those, those spikes here looks wider, but in terms of speed, here I'm speaking about picosecond versus here we're milli milliseconds. So they are very fast. Um, on another hand, the brain trans transmit information on long distance uh, through the axons that are lossless line. And in the Josephson junction world, the spikes can also be transmitted on long distance with transmissions line. The capability to modify the memory is called plasticity. And in the brain, it is achieved through the synapse. In this talk, I'm going to show that we can use a magnetic Josephson junction to reproduce this behavior. In terms of number, uh, the brain has about 100 billion of neurons, whereas um, according to the, the current state of the art, a chip can include about 1 million Josephson junctions. So here we see that it is a five order of magnitude less than for the brain, but we, we think it's a pretty decent place to start. So we're not going to be discouraged by that. And um, finally, the speed of the brain is about 100 Hertz, whereas the Josephson junction can spike 1 million times faster than the brain. So here we start to get a good feeling on why this device is interesting. So let's focus a little bit more on this device uh, that we developed at NIST, which is a magnetic Josephson junction. Before we dive into the magnetic aspect of the device, let me tell you a few basic properties about a Josephson junction itself. A Josephson junction consists in two superconductors that are separated by a non-superconducting barrier. It is usually characterized by its IV curve that shows the voltage as a function of the current that is sent through the, through the junction. 
So we are going to see a lot of these curves in this presentation. So uh, I think it's worth taking one minute to explain a little bit more how they work. So this curve have typically two regimes. When the current is below a critical value that we call the critical current, the junction operates in a superconducting state. However, above this critical current, the device starts emitting some um, quantized spikes that we call single flux quantum. So in this regime, the DC voltage that we measure here is actually the time average value of the spiking state of the device. Uh, so the Josephson junction that we study here is a little bit special because it is a magnetic Josephson junction, meaning that the barrier is composed of magnetic clusters inside a dielectric. Not that for pretty long time, people were actually reluctant to add uh, magnetic material in superconducting devices because uh, we all know that magnetism tends to kill the superconducting effect. However, if we use it well, this combination can bring interesting properties. More specifically, I'm, I, will, I would like to show you here that the combination of the natural spiking behavior from the Josephson junction and the plasticity from the magnetic clusters can allow some synaptic behavior. So let's have a closer look at the sample itself and the magnetic aspect of the device. So here, the barrier consists of clusters of manganese inside a, a matrix of silicon. And it is enclosed between two layers of niobium. So to, to make the clusters, we deposit a fin uh, with a sputter deposition where here we have multi layers of silicon and manganese. We then uh, anneal the sample at 400 degrees for 10 minutes. And uh, it allows the form. So by doing that, it allows the formation of the clusters. Uh, the device is then processed uh, with optical lithography in the shape of pillars, uh, where here the diameter will vary between one and 10 micrometers. So we look at the magnetic properties of the device uh, with squid measurements. So on this graph, I show the magnetic moment as a function of the temperature. When the temperature is decreased from room temperature to 4 Kelvin. The temperature uh, corresponding to the maximum magnetic moment uh, right here is called the blocking temperature. So above this temperature, the cluster are in a super paramagnetic state, meaning that the orientation of their magnetization is unstable due to the high thermal uh, energy. Below the blocking temperature, the magnetization of the cluster is blocked in a fixed direction. So we can use this property to reset the orientation of the magnetic clusters with the temperature. So basically what we do is heating the sample and let it cool down in the absence or in the presence of magnetic field. So let's do that. We now repeat the measurements in the presence of the magnetic field. In this case, we observe that the magnetic moment at low temperature increases with the value of the magnetic field. This means that we are ordering the clusters magnetically. So here, the, the, minimum, the minimum magnetic moment correspond to a disordered state where uh, the cluster magnetization are pointing in random directions. And uh, a high magnetic moment will correspond to a highly ordered state where the magnetization of the clusters are all aligned. So the main takeaway of this slide here is that the magnetic order of the device can be controlled with the temperature. 
To measure the device electrically, we place the sample inside a probe station that, that operates at 4 Kelvin. And we use uh, two probes, which are a ground signal ground probes, in order to uh, apply a current and measure a voltage through the device. By doing that, uh, we can measure the IV curves of the device when the sample is in a disordered state or when it is in an ordered state. Interestingly, we see that the critical current can be tuned with the magnetic order. Indeed, uh, here we observe that uh, for, a, or for a device that is magnetically disordered, the critical current is way bigger than the critical current of a device that is magnetically ordered. So to put, just wanted to take one minute here to put this result in perspective. So we, we can make a simple comparison with a device that we all know, which is the MTJ, the magnetic tunnel junction. In a magnetic tunnel junction uh, with a high TMR, the change of resistance is rarely more than a factor of two. Here with the magnetic Josephson junction, we observe a change of critical current that is two orders of magnitude between the disordered and the ordered state. So we're really speaking about a significant change here. So here we, we can see already that in this uh, work, uh, being able to control the magnetic order of the device is uh, important. So we are going to use two different methods to control the magnetic order. The first one, in some way, I already described it before. It consists in heating the device and letting it cool down in the presence or in the absence of a magnetic field. So that allows to obtain this ordered or this disordered magnetic state. For the second method, now we keep the device at, uh, at, at 4K at all time, but we apply short current pulses through the device in the presence or in the absence of magnetic field. So here again, it allows to obtain an ordered or disordered state of the device. So the, the first method here is easy, um, pretty easy to implement, but it is also slow and it's not easily compatible with neuromorphic applications since it, it requires a lot of energy to increase the temperature and it takes a lot of time to cool down. However, um, the second method is more invasive and more complex to set up, but once it is done, it has the advantage to be very fast and it is compatible with neuromorphic application. Because in this case, uh, the ordering properties here can be controlled while maintaining the sample at 4K. So, Using the second method of ordering with fast electrical pulses, we look at the critical current as a function of the number of pulses, which are applied uh, through the device, uh, where here we talk about 11 picojoule pulses. So very, very short, very small pulses. So by doing that, we see that we can tune the magnetic order of the device with the number of pulses which also allows to tune the critical current. So more importantly, we see that in addition of having a, a high value and a low value of critical current, as we observed before, we now also have access to intermediate states of critical current in such a way that we have a quasi analog variation of the critical current. So this result is important because it is this property that will allow to use the device as a synaptic weight. So finally, before I move on, I also wanted to point out that um, the physics of the device here is not completely understood. 
in sense that we don't really understand that the physics that allow to order the clusters with the electrical pulses. So our first assumption here was to think that we were hitting the device with the pulses. However, uh, even if all the energy of the pulses went into heating the junction, the, we would expect a temperature increase of roughly 15 Kelvin, which is way below the value of the blocking temperature, which for this sample is 52 Kelvin. So here we see that there are still some parts that we don't understand and that we would like to explore. I told you earlier that um, hardware for AI at the device level has the potential for low energy computation. So let's look at the energy needed for the device. Here, I dissociate two types of energy, the training energy, which correspond to the energy of the pulse needed to modify the magnetic anisotropy of the clusters. And we have also the spiking energy, which corresponds to the energy that we need to emit a single flux quantum pulse. So on this graph on the left, I'm showing the pulse uh, of, so the, the pulse energy as a function of the area of the device. Here we see that the energy of the device is scalable with the size of the device. And um, for, for the lowest uh, size of device that we have here, we see that the, the energy can be as low as one attojoule for the training energy and 10 zeptojoule for the spiking energy. So let's try to put that in perspective. Uh, if, we, if we compare with the brain, the brain needs about 10 femtojoule to emit a spike. So here you can tell me that it is not very fair comparison because the brain works at room temperature versus our device needs to be cooled down at four Kelvin. So however, uh, even if we take into account the effect effective cooling overhead that we need to cool down the device uh, and maintain it at four Kelvin, we see that our device can still be more efficient than the brain. So here it, also, it really shows uh, how interesting these devices are. So despite the promising results that we have with this magnetic Josephson junction, there are several points that we don't understand or that would need to be optimized. So for example, we don't, as I mentioned before, we don't really understand the mechanism that allows to tune the magnetic order with the pulses. There are many transport properties that are not well understood yet. On another hand, we also would like to study the relation between the number of accessible state of critical currents and the number of clusters. Uh, finally, the training energy is related to the magnetic anisotropy, meaning that uh, if we were able to tune the cluster property, we should also be able to improve the training energy of the device. So for all these reasons, we would like to tune the cluster properties to understand the physics of the device and optimize its properties. Unfortunately, it turns out that the silicon manganese is not the best material to do some accurate training uh, some accurate tuning of the cluster property due to, the, uh, due to the deposition process that we used here. So for this reason, we would like to study another material system than the silicon manganese that will allow a fine tuning of the cluster properties. So to do that, we actually worked with uh, Kestru Institute of Technology who own a custom deposition system, which allows a fine tuning of the cluster properties. So now we're going to switch gear and work with a new sample that is uh, made with a barrier of germanium and iron, where here the iron are the magnetic clusters. 
So uh, here again, the barrier is in sandwich between two layers of niobium. So in this case, uh, the sample is deposited with a size selective low energy nanoparticle deposition system. So this means that, um, so basically we're working, so we're able to choose the properties of the device. And in this case, we're going to work with cluster, which are about 1000 atom size and a blocking temperature of 4 Kelvin. So I would like to point out that uh, right now to date, the magnetic Josephson junction has never been demonstrated in any other system than the silicon manganese. So therefore here, our initial goal is just to demonstrate that the synaptic behavior can also be obtained with this new system with a germanium iron barrier. As a reminder, to, rem to demonstrate that we can use the device as a synapse, we need to, demonst to demonstrate that the critical current depends on the magnetic order, and also that we have a quasi-analog variation of the critical current with electrical pulses. So let's, let's focus on the, the first uh, question. So using the cool down device method, uh, so we use like this first method to, this temperature method to order or disorder the device. By doing that, we see that the critical current of the blue curves here that correspond to an ordered state is actually has a critical current that is, a, that is 100 times smaller than the critical current for the red curve for the disordered state. So these quick measurements tell us that this result fulfills our first requirement that the critical current must depend on the magnetic order to act as a synapse. So now we want to know if uh, also quasi-analog variation of the critical current with uh, electrical pulses. So by using the second method of ordering with electrical pulses, we now measure the critical current as a function of the number of pulses for pulses of about five picojoules. Here again, we are able to demonstrate that we can reach intermediate state of the critical current with the number of pulses. So here this result fulfill our second requirement uh, for the magnetic Josephson junction to behave as a synapse, which is that uh, we have a quasi-analog variation of the critical current with electrical pulses. So therefore here, we can conclude that the germanium iron magnetic Josephson junction can be used as a synaptic device. So we're excited about these results because it opens up some new option to study the physics of the device, which uh, by, by tuning the properties of the clusters. And hopefully that's going to help us to improve the performance of the device. And uh, in addition, it also opens up new options to optimize the material for synaptic devices in neuromorphic applications. So I would like to move to the last part of my talk. So here uh, I'm going to show how we can use the synaptic behavior of the magnetic Josephson junction in a neuromorphic application. So for that, we can build a, base, um, a basic neuromorphic cell with Josephson junction and magnetic Josephson junction. In a simple way, um, I can, so I'm not going to go in, in the detail of this figure here, but in a simple way, I can divide this neuromorphic cell in three parts. We have a presynaptic neuron that generates an initial spike. We have the synapse, which is composed of the magnetic Josephson junction and which is used to apply the synaptic weight. And we have a postsynaptic neuron which makes the decision to trigger or not an output spike, uh, depending on the incoming 
uh, weighted spike from the synapse. So, so far I've been a little bit vague on the way the neuron makes this uh, final decision to trigger or not an output spike based on the input. So the magic of the operation here uh, lies in this little f uh, in front of the sum. This little f here is called the activation function. It is basically the function that would determine if the output of the neural network should be a yes, let's fire a spike, or no, let's do nothing. A very common activation function used in software neural network is called the sigmoid function, and it has the following shape. So in our case, we use a WR spice, which is a circuit level time domain simulation to simulate uh, our neuromorphic cell with a magnetic Josephson junction. So what we look what we do here is that we look at the variation of the critical current of the output postsynaptic neuron as a function of the initial value of the critical current of the magnetic Josephson junction. And by doing so, we demonstrate that we can obtain a sigmoidal, a sigmoidal activation function where the variation is the critical current of the magnetic Josephson junction. So to verify that our simulation results are relevant, we fabricate physically the, the neuromorphic cell and compare it with our simulations. So for that, we work with the MIT uh, Lincoln Lab Foundry to build the neuromorphic cell. So in this case, we actually replace the magnetic Josephson junction by four fixed Josephson junctions with different critical current. So the figure here is, uh, is actually, it's not just a design, it's actually a real photo. It's an optical picture uh, that we took of the circuit uh, out when it came out of the foundry. So interestingly, we were able to see that the measurement of the circuit here in red show a very good match of the simulation uh, and the experimental data. So we think that obviously we think the process error margins. margins. So this result here is uh, very important for us because it shows that we can trust our simulations, not, not only in terms of the trend, but in terms of the number and the values that we obtain. So finally, I would like to show an example where we use our neuromorphic cell with the magnetic Josephson junction inside the neural network. So here we use a nine pixel classifier for high speed recognition. So the goal of the neural network here is, um, is to train, so the, the goal is to train the neural network to recognize the letter Z, V and N. So let, let's take the example of an incoming signal with the letter Z. So the incoming, enigma, the incoming image is decomposed in a, in a colon vector, which determines if the presynaptic neuron will fire a spike or not. So after we let the network do, do its magic, we obtain an output spike for the letter Z and nothing for the lecture V and N. So here we see that the network is able to recognize the letter Z. Our network is also robust to a one pixel of uh, input noise. So for example, in this incoming image, if I replace the first pixel uh, by a, from a one to a zero, then uh, we see that the we, we get a second spike for the letter Z, nothing for the two other letters. So we see that the network was again about to recognize the letter Z because it is the closest from the three letters. So we can keep going and analyze all the images of Z, V, and N with any one pixel input noise. 
and every time the network will return a spikes only for the correct letter. So with this network, we were able to obtain a 100% accuracy of recognition uh, with a frequency um, to recon like we were able to run the, the, all the images one after the others at a frequency of 125 gigahertz, which is significant, significantly high speed. So although the network here is very simple, it shows that the magnetic Josephson junction can be used as a synapse in a neuromorphic network. So, uh, so, so far we've done this simulation, we've done this work only at the simulation level, but uh, of course our next uh, goal and our next step is to create this nine pixel classifier uh, experimentally. Before I conclude my talk, I would like to compare the performance of the magnetic Josephson junction with other technologies. So on this graph here, uh, from Nikonov and Young, uh, they show the relative relation between the energy and the delay of our different emergent technologies to reproduce the Linet model. So don't worry if you don't know what is a Linet model. It is just a, a famous Convol convolutional neural network uh, that we use for reference. So we can make a, a very rough, a very rough estimation of um, the energy that we need to how, how it will compare with the other technologies. So let's see how our device performs. We have seen with the previous simulation that our neural network based on the magnetic Josephson junction can operate at 125 gigahertz. This corresponds to a delay of eight picoseconds. In addition, we have measured that the spiking energy of the magnetic Josephson junction is about 100 Z to joule. And we know that uh, for Linet circuits, we need about 13 million elements. So this means that in total, we would need uh, an, energy, an energy of roughly one picojoule. Finally, let's not forget to take into account the cooling power that we need to operate the circuit at 4K. And uh, in this case, we obtained that the total energy to reproduce the Linet model would be uh, with a very rough estimate about one nanojoule. So if we compare these results with the other technologies, here is where our device should be. So obviously you can tell me that the comparison here is not very fair uh, since our number are obtained with a very small circuit, uh, which is very simple compared to a very big circuits needed for Linet. So we, which is way more complex. However, uh, we think that it is a very good result knowing that it is only a preliminary work. And we notice that we still have a few decades of space in terms of delay to make this device competitive. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk. So in this presentation, I have shown that the magnetic Josephson junction is a hybrid magnetic superconducting device, which can be used as artificial synapses by tuning its critical current with magnetic order. So this device has several advantages. Uh, it is naturally spiking, it is fast, and it has low energy. Recently, we have shown that uh, the synaptic properties are also observed in a new material system that provide more options to tune the cluster properties. So these results open up some new options to study the physics of the device and also to optimize new materials for synaptic devices in neuromorphic applications. Finally, I have shown that the magnetic Josephson junction can be included in a neuromorphic circuit. Uh, and more specifically, we have demonstrated that we can obtain an activation function with a circuit-based on the magnetic Josephson junction, and uh, and we we have 
and uh, we have shown also that we can use it uh, to be the high speed recognition network. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'd be happy to welcome your questions. Okay, thank you so much, Emily, for this excellent talk. On behalf of everyone, I clap for you. Really nice uh, uh, overview of uh, interesting things. Uh, there are a couple of questions, but before that, I'd like to request all uh, to switch on your camera. Emily, uh, maybe you can stop your uh, screen sharing for a second. And uh, I don't know if you can switch on your camera or use your mobile phone if it is possible. Yeah, let me connect with my mobile phone. Yes, we, we will be uh, waiting for that. And thank you all for, uh, please uh, switch on your camera if possible. We will wait for Emily, and then I will take a screenshot. Yeah, it's working. So, uh, great. Okay, I'm taking. A lot of people have not switched on. Okay, it's their choice. Smile. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Uh, so we can switch on, uh, switch off your cameras now. And uh, Emily, you can share your screen. And uh, we have uh, some questions. Uh, the first question by Sachiraj Misra is asking why the magnetic movement becomes saturated at high temperature in magnetic Josephson junctions. Uh, why the magnetic moments become saturated at high temperature? Yes. Oops. So you mean here? Is that is that the question? Well, uh, I don't know. Such as uh, probably he means that yes. So uh, here, basically, what's happened um, is that we heat the sample. And when we are here, the sample is like it's, uh, in a, is randomly saturated. Oh, sorry, I have to say it again. It's all the clusters are in a random orientation. And uh, it's, it's just thermal energy. So it, it just, you, you won't get any ordering at this temperature. Yes, I mean it's uh, it's not really saturated. It's just zero magnetization. So, yeah, it. I mean it. It's saturated zero. <laughs> yes, I know to say it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question by Azam. And, and, yeah, and just and just in case you wonder, like why it's not exactly the, the same value here, uh, it's mainly an artifact of measure due to the fact we we don't have an ultra low field module on our squid. So, but. It, it's about the same. Uh, but the samples are deposited on which substrate? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Or yeah. Which substrate? Yeah. Uh, uh, silicon oxide. Silicon dioxide. So maybe uh, at, at small uh, temperature, uh, it just shows some diamagnetic behavior. Is it possible? Uh, yeah, and uh, it's mainly like it's, we don't have the ultra low module that you need on the squid to okay. get like, it's so a we get like a little bit of artifact at very low temperature, but uh, yeah. it really doesn't affect much of measurement. Yes. Okay, uh, I have a few questions, but I will ask later. Let's take from others. Azam Ali Khan, please unmute and ask your question. Uh, uh, hello, sorry, I'm just- So I'm I just want to saying... ask that, that... Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add, I, I'm just seeing the question in the chat right now, and I feel that I misunderstood the previous question. They ask uh, which dielectric medium is used, and just wanted to make sure they're not talking about the, the matrix inside the barrier. So if that's the question is silicon inside the barrier, that's it. And sorry, now I'm happy to hear the next question. Oh, can I ask? Yes. Yeah, yes. Question? Hello? 
सो हियर वी आर यूजिंग इलेक्ट्रिक पल्सेस टू कंट्रोल द मैग्नेटाइजेशन ऑफ सुपर पैंटिंग मटेरियल सो आई एम आस्किंग दैट वी कैन यूज मैग्नेटो इलेक्ट्रिक मटेरियल टू कंट्रोल द मैग्नेटाइजेशन और मॉडुलेट द मैग्नेटाइजेशन टू चेंज द क्रिटिकल करंट yes that's that's a very good question actually oh. uh, so the the one thing where i would be a little bit careful as i mentioned at one point in my uh, in my talk it is is actually challenging to work with a continuous film of a, a continuous magnetic field because it tends to kill the superconductivity of the device and um uh, having a full you know some people also ask me if i could use like uh, magnetic domain walls to modify the the magnetization for example but i'm pretty anxious about working with a full layer of a magnet of magnetic film uh, i think it's going to have some effects on the superconductivity here but that's definitely something that could be tried uh, but uh, in uh, but uh, as a, a lower temperature so the all the spin is ordered so it also create a effective field so it it might hamper no? in, in in that way the superconductivity how how it would be different like a ferromagnetic material and this ordered spin below the blo blo block term, blocking temperature how both are these thing different um i i'm not sure understood the question do you mind repeating like uh, as we are below the as the spins are ordered so it will it will behave like a ferromagnetic material so in that case also it it may hamper the superconductivity like we are ordering the spin by electric pulses so how it is different between uh, or what is the difference between you the ordered asking, spin are you asking between the difference between the, the the characteristic magnetic temperature versus the characteristic superconducting temperature no yes, i think yeah. uh, I, i mean ajam if you allow me uh, i think he's asking yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, when you uh, go in the block regime and you are applying magnetic field you are saturating the spins in let's say in one direction so it's like a ferromagnetic state mm -hmm. so, uh, probably he is referring to some uh, the basic concepts of superconductivity that superconductivity and magnetism and are antagonistic so he is asking like when you are having a ferromagnetic uh, spacer between the uh, superconductors does it somehow affect the performance am i right ajam yes yes oh okay okay um it would affect in some way because it kind of create a so sorry so if you would have a full super if if you have a super uh Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking at center. <laughs> you're asking. Um, so yeah, whatever is inside uh, this barrier will, will have a, a big difference. Uh, a continuous film will not allow the full um, uh, tuning of the magnetic order, but will also have some other challenging on the superconductivity. Um, yeah, I'm not sure it answers your question though. <laughs> Oh, okay okay thank you okay thank you ajay okay thank you um, thank you thank you sir. i have one question uh, emily so um, yeah. how uh, how much is the dimension of this uh, pillar what you are showing here let's say how much is what the dimension what is the dimension uh, yeah uh, it's so roughly like the easiest for us is to work with big devices they are actually very big compared to magnetic tunnel junction Okay. Uh, like here, we we work with one or ten micrometer meters width, and like here you have the thickness. So our barrier is like here is seven nanometer, but we also work with uh, even smaller than that. So you are telling when you do the annealing, the continuous thin film kind of breaks into clusters. Am I right? Yeah. So when you anneal it, is when like with I, I'm not an expert in terms of a. Uh, clusters but it is when like basically like this energy uh, is more favorable for the cluster orientation and and what is the dimension of these nano clusters uh i actually oh god i don't remember we've done some some studies about it so i i can i don't remember exactly for those one but i can tell you for this one that we use with iron for example 
we yeah. were typically at one atom per iron, uh, one, uh, sorry, 1,000 atom of iron per clusters. So, so that's basically uh, two nanometers. Two nanometers yeah. per meter. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in some way, they do, they do interact. Uh, so, sorry, we don't, one thing we would like to study is uh, what is, how much do interaction do we have between all of them? Are they really completely independent? Or are they touching each other? Are they, how much do they interact with each other? And that's definitely something we would like to study. And that's why we needed to work uh, with those people to be able to, uh, to do more size selective uh, cluster deposition. Yeah, I mean, uh, as we know that if the, uh, the, the steps between these uh, nanoparticles or nanoclusters, whatever you say, uh, you vary the dipolar interaction basically plays a role. So you can have the individual uh, blocking state or you can have the super spin glass state or even super ferromagnetism if they're really strongly interacting. So uh, I can send you some papers for you are aware of that. And it would be really interesting to see like how the transport characterization changes when you change yeah. these uh, interaction uh, regimes, so to say. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree with you. I would be very interested to see that. Uh, yeah, I would be happy to, to see your papers. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I can send you that uh, later on. Uh, <clears throat> so this is really interesting. And, uh, I have one more question before I take another question by somebody else, uh, Romes. Um, um, what is so special about the German I uh, germanium iron? I mean, in principle, you are looking for a nanoparticle state and you are looking for something uh, which, uh, which will behave superparamagnetic uh, in several tens of kelvins. So what is so special about this germanium iron? Uh, why did we choose to go with germanium iron? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was many reason at the time, uh, well, I can't give you the easy answer, which is, is what they had in the chamber. Oh. <laughs> and, but uh, it, it, it was different, there was not only that in the chamber. Uh, we were also trying to reduce the, there is one characteristic um, uh, parameter that we look in Josephson junction, which is the, the, the product of the critical current by the normal resistance. And we were going to, we were trying to um, decrease the value to, sorry, we're trying to increase the value of this uh, product uh, because we wanted to see some uh, other superconducting properties. Uh, and so that's why we, we decided to go with germanium to have more, um, um, to have more resistivity. Uh, iron is really more because it's one thing they knew how to do with that and uh, what they had in the chamber, uh, some other, I think we would be interested to try more with nickel, uh, which uh, tends to have better success with uh, superconductivity in general and to kill less the critical current. So. Okay, uh, sounds good, thank you. Uh, Ramesh uh, has another question. What happens to the IC if we replace magnetic nanoparticles with non-magnetic metal particles? Oh, uh, actually it would probably go up quite a bit. <laughs> uh, the critical, so, the, but okay, so basically the magnetization, the higher, the higher the magnetization, the more it tends to decrease the critical current. So that's why we, we had to find this right tuning of having the right material, the right size of a device, of a cluster. But uh, if, you, if you remove the, the, part, the magnetic particles, uh, yeah, it would be much better on the IC uh, however, you won't have this uh, tuning capability of the critical current. Okay. So uh, if I do not see more questions, uh, I think it was very nice interactions. Um, Emily, can I request you to stop sharing your screen? I like to share my screen uh, before we kind of uh, uh, conclude. Uh, I like to actually uh, bring to your attention that next week there will be no W2S seminar because we will be hosting this conference, Symposium on Magnetism and Spintronics. It's an international conference and it's completely online. And the registration is free. Uh, the uh, abstract submission deadline is gone, but the registration deadline is 20th November. So in case any of you are interested, most welcome. 
and it is actually organized uh, from 2 p.m. Indian time to like 9.30 p.m. Indian time. So even people from America, Brazil can attend and there are speakers. So I like to bring that to your attention and I hope uh, I will uh, see many of you next week in that conference. So before we conclude, a small token of appreciation from our WTS team uh, for Emily. So I'd like to read it. Uh, WTS seminar webinar series on Spintronics. Nice sir, goodness of India. Text pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Emily Jue, University of Colorado Boulder, USA NIST, USA. In recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on magnetic Josephson Johnson for artificial synapses. So thank you so much, uh, Emily. I think you are friends, so merci beaucoup. And uh, <laughs> yes. yes, so thank you so much again. And I hope you can join some other talks, uh, which I have organized mostly in the evenings because the day are really very uh, awkward time for you. Uh, but the uh, evening 8 p.m. talks, you can probably attend uh, some of them. And uh, yeah, so I hope to see you, any of you next week. And then subsequent week, we will have again uh, the WPS seminar. I think by Professor um, Vincent Cross from Thales. Again, another French guy. So thank you so much and take care. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, thank you. It was really a pleasure. We really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much, Emily. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Emily. Have a nice day.